Well, there went our numbers. <laughs> man, oh man. You know, God is really good. And, and He's really good all the time. And you know, you don't have to look around very far, very long, very hard to find out the truth that truth is something that is being uh, rubbed out, if, that, if I can say that. Everybody's so concerned about offending somebody with the truth. Listen, if God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. And if God said it, I'm going to say it. Amen. So I want to share with you this morning some words of truth. Some words of truth, some uh, to to bring us back to a place of of uh, well, in in math they called it the lowest common denominator. Amen. And and truth, if if we can't build whatever we're building on truth, it isn't going to stand. Amen. So Lord, this morning as we take these next few moments, Lord, I know we're anxious to to get the. The, the, the day started and the picnic and the fun and all those kinds of things. But Lord, Your Word, we're going we're gonna to belly up to Your table first. Lord, we're going to fast and, and feast rather on Your Word. And Lord, we're going to allow You to feed us in our spirit today by Your Word. So Lord, I need Your anointing today uh, to preach and to share Your Word Lord, with, with, with authority, with, with the unction of the Holy Spirit, I pray today, God, that you would take that coal from the altar and touch these lips of clay today. Lord, that I would speak boldly what your word is conveying today. And I pray every person in this place today that no one leaves the way we came in, but that we'd be changed by the power of your Holy Spirit. And I thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. So in a time where nobody seems to know what truth is anymore, um, I want to take a refreshing look at truth. I want for us to look at a man that walked with Jesus and in fact was one of Jesus' closest friends. He was in the inner circle. His name is John. We, we know him as John the Beloved, John the Revelator. Jesus told John in Revelations, to write to the seven churches that knew and trusted John and who had read his earlier letters. These were in fact literal churches in literal cities. The letters were addressed so that it could be read and passed on in a systemic fashion, following the main Roman road clockwise around the province of Asia. Listen, God's Word is still the truth for today. Listen, not everybody's happy about that. Not everybody's happy that there's still a standard. We saw it in the clip, uh, the movie clip, that God's not dead. There's a world out there. You heard it if you caught it. The, 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 the prosecuting attorney said, I'm, gonna, I'm putting a stop to everything you believe in. Listen, he's not the only one. He's not the only one. There are myriads of people that want to shut up the church. That want to stop what God wants to do. And I'm just crazy enough to say, you know what, I ain't stopping. I've come way too far to turn back now. Amen? And when they said it, I was, I was going to share it in my sermon a little bit later, and I might again, but I'd lot rather stand with God and be judged by the world than stand with the world and be judged by God. Amen? Because I'll guarantee you right now, that ain't not no place you want to be. Ain't not no place. That's good vernacular. <laughs> I don't care who you are. Ain't not no place is good vernacular. That's Myrtle Creek in. The professor can use that down the road, all right? Glory to God. So the letters are addressed so that they can be passed along. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 1. Go clear to the back. We're going to the back of the book. 
Revelations chapter 1, starting in verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from Him who is and who was and is to come. Man, I could stop right there and preach the rest of the day. Huh? He who was and is, and here's a Here's the key, folks. He's coming back. He is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before His throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over, over the kings of the earth, to Him who loved us and was washed from the, our sins in His own blood and has made us kings and priests, to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Behold, he is coming in the clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Listen. He's the beginning and the end. Amen? He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the lily of the valley. He is the rose of Sharon. He's the bright morning star. I mean, it goes on and on. If that don't excite you, somebody needs to check for a pulse. Listen, we live in a day of conflicting claims of various religions and I'm telling you, they can't all be true. So how do you know which one's true? If it don't line up with this, it ain't true. It isn't true. I'm telling you, they're out there. They want to make everything conform to them. Listen, God... Well, let me put it to you this way. Here's what we want. Come here. Put the book down. You get to be God this morning. I know, that's a big job. It's a big job, but you can handle it, all right? Here's, here's, what, here's what we want to have happen. I'm going to stand right here, and I want you to start walking around me. Just walk in big circles around me. Keep going. See, this is what we want. This is what we want. In the flesh, we want God to revolve around us. Ha-ha! <laughs> But that isn't the case. The case is, for us, would you hold still? <laughs> I'll tell you when to go. Our job is to revolve around Him. Give her a great big hand. Can I just tell you something? God's the author and the finisher of our faith. He does not need an editor. He's not going to conform His Word to fit your life. He's called you and I to conform our life to line up with His Word. So, in a day of conflicting claims of various religions, and the desire to be tolerant of all others. That was a big word, wasn't it? To be tolerant of all others. How many of you have seen all the bumper stickers? They got the peace sign, they got every, every, every and it, it all coexist. Well, we can coexist as long as you don't try and shut me up. As long as you don't try and get me to conform to your ideas. Because if your ideas don't line up with God's Word, we aren't going to get along. Because I'm going to speak the truth in love of what God's Word says. And if you can't, if the world can't accept that, listen, He flooded the earth once, remember? Go back in Genesis and begin to read what was going on in the world when the world got flooded. 
And then look out your window. Because it's beginning to look crazy like that in our day and age. And he's still being patient with us. How do we as Christians determine what we believe? Well, we regard Jesus Christ as our faithful witness. He is the one that has literally been there and done that. He's the one that hung on the cross. He's the one that died for, the, for, for my life. He's the one that gave his life as a ransom for me. And if you know anything about me, if you've ever heard me preach before, or if you've known me from years gone by, you'll know that I needed some redeeming in my life. hear chuckles out there every one of us have needed to be redeemed he's the one that has literally been there he's the only religious leader who has ever risen from the dead so when we read John's description of this vision we have to keep in mind that his words are not just good advice they are the truth from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We don't just read His words because they're interesting and there's some amazing portrayal of the future. Let the truth about Christ penetrate your life. Can I just tell you something? When the truth about Christ penetrates your life, it's going to begin to stir some things up inside of you. You can't have an encounter with Jesus Christ and just go on like everything's fine. Because ain't nothing going to ever be the same. I tried it. I tried this living like uh, that guy again. And I couldn't enjoy it. It wasn't any fun. See, the truth about Christ, when it penetrates your life, it deepens your faith in Him. It strengthens your commitment to follow Him, no matter what the cost. Listen, if you knew everything that Jesus has redeemed me from, you, it, 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 there's no way I could turn around. There's no way I can go back from that. He's redeemed me from yesterday. Anybody have a Yesterday? I had one yesterday. I mean, it ain't that far away. Where were you when I was hooking that water heater back up, Skippy? 240 volts went right through me, man. I'll tell you what, I was... Woo! That'll make you dance a jig, I guarantee you. Man! Well, I... Didn't know which one it was. And so I, was, I have an ohm meter and a volt meter, but if you, you can have 15 of them. If you don't know how they work, doesn't do you any good. Okay? And I didn't know how it worked. I, they got all these squiggly lines and V's and lines going this way and that. Why can't they just say 110, 220, DC, AC? No, they got to be all scientific. So it takes a neo-scientist to figure it out. Who said, who said that? <laughs> I couldn't find the breaker, Skippy. That's what I'm talking about. I do not need any help from that crowd. I wanted, like none other, to shut the breaker off. But I couldn't figure out. How many of you know hot water heaters don't have a light on that comes on when it's on and goes off when it's off? They don't have that. Whew. Don't make me come back there. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> the last part of verse 5 says to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests 
to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. See, John's writing to believers that have been experiencing persecution. We haven't seen persecution yet, church. We've not seen that yet. But we're going to. I believe we're going to begin to. John was writing to believers that were experiencing persecution, yet he assured them that Jesus not only continuously cares for them and loves them, but he has also set us free. No matter how you might feel today, according to God's word, you have been set free by the power of the Holy Spirit. When you had the blood of Jesus applied to your life, this blood that we just celebrated Right here, when we do it in remembrance of Him, it's a reminder that I've been washed in the blood. I'm no longer my own. I've been bought with a price. We ain't going to be perfect every day. You're not. But you can be redeemed every day. You can live for Jesus every day. Even on those days when you blow it miserably and the devil comes to you and he says, you know what, you just won't give up because there ain't no hope for you. Oh yes, there is. I've been washed in the blood and Jesus is but a prayer away. Jesus set them free and He set us free by His blood. That is through His death on the cross. And through that blood He made us His people, to be a kingdom of priests, to serve God the Father and His children. That's you and I. Us. We need to serve one another. It's through that blood He made it, made His people. Kingdom, kingdoms, to be a kingdom and to be priests. Israel had been called a kingdom of priests. They'd been called a holy nation. In fact, in Exodus 19 and 6 it says, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. See, these are words which you shall speak to your children or to the children of Israel. They're words that you need to be speaking to your children. They're words that you need to speak to one another. Listen, you're not who you used to be. You're a priest. You're a kingdom. We uh, as a congregation are a kingdom of priests. We're a royal priesthood, hello. How about, we're a peculiar people. We're strangers, we're sojourners. We're just passing through this place. But together, you and I as believers make up a kingdom of which Christ is our king. Individually, we are priests because each of us has direct access to God because of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Our whole purpose is to serve God. Our whole purpose is to serve God. I love what it says in Ephesians 13, verse 15 through 16 he says therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name but do not forget to do good and to share for which sacrifices god is well pleased listen the need for blood sacrifice ended when jesus died on the cross But Christians do have a sacrifice that we can bring to Him continually. It's called a sacrifice of praise. Let me tell you something. For my wife to sit at that piano and play today, I promise you, was a sacrifice. A sacrifice. That cost her something. But she knows that that's just what we have to do. It's a sacrifice of praise. God's going to grow her. God's going to stretch her to to do more of that. I just know that He is. But God wants us to offer ourselves and not animals as living sacrifice to daily lay aside our own desire so that we can follow Him. That's where we lose half the church or more, right there. I don't mind being a Christian and going to church But when I have to lay my own 
my own desires uh, and my own everything um, aside? Wait just a cotton-picking minute. <laughs> Let's rethink this. No, there ain't no rethinking it. There's no rethinking it. We, we have to lay aside my own desires. That's hard. That's tough. But it's what we need to do. We, we do it out of gratitude that our sins have even been forgiven. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm pretty thankful that God ain't holding against me what I have in my past. Listen, I could, I could share with you, and I'm not going to, but I could share with you things that would just make your hair curl in my life. Are there any beauticians in the house? Because that's the only way it's going to happen, sister. <laughs> See, we do it with praise because we've been made acceptable to God through Christ's sacrifice. By continually offering praise and, or sacrifice of praise, we confess His name and we show that we're loyal to Him. He loves us, church. Hosea chapter 14, verse 1 and 2. O oh, Israel, cry, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to Him, take away all iniquity. Revive us graciously, for we will suffer, or we will rather offer the sacrifices of our lips. Man, that's a cry for repentance, church. The children of Israel, every time they turned around, they were in, in, a, in a bad place. And when they were delivered out of the land of bondage, when, they, when God delivered them miraculously out of Egypt, and they, they, they're on their, their quest for the promised land, what do they do? They start grumbling and complaining, want to go back into bondage. I don't know how honest you want to get today, but we are talking about truth. How many of us at one point or another have desired to go back to, into, into bondage to your past life? Because it, sometimes it just seems that following after the Lord is just hard. He never said it was going to be easy. He said it'd be worth it. He said it'd be worth it. This was the last appeal made by God through the prophet Hosea urging his people to return to him and to be cleansed of the sins causing them to fall and to be destroyed. God even told them what to say. God even told them what to say. Take away all iniquity, he said. Re re receive us graciously. How many of you know that today in the middle of all your mess, he'll receive you graciously? When we come to God in that moment, He's not saying, you know what, I knew you was going to be like that. I knew you was going to blow it. I have just enough of the blood of the Son left to cleanse you. And he never says that. He's always got more than enough. He's always willing and, and ready to take away all of your iniquity. The people could return to God if they would just simply ask Him to forgive their sins. Can I tell you, it's the same today. If people would just come to God and say, God, forgive me, He'll forgive you. It'll make a difference what you've done. Listen, if I can get saved, ain't nobody else can't get saved. I promise you. If He can redeem me... <laughs> It's true for us. We can pray Hosea's prayer 
and know that our sins are forgiven because Christ died for them on the cross. Remember John 3.16? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever, that's us. If we would just believe in Him, we wouldn't perish. We'd have everlasting life. You know how you can tell what your value is? You want to know how you can tell? I watch American Pickers every once in a while. That's a pretty cool show. They got some great junk on there. One man's junk's another man's treasure. And those guys go in there and they find some little object that they want, and then they begin to barter. They begin to talk back and forth. And the, 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 the amount, the, the, the purchase price, the, the, let's see, the level of value for that object is determined by what somebody is willing to pay for it. Some people want some things more than other people. Some people will give $100 for something I wouldn't give them $25 for. But they want it, and so they'll pay for it. Can I just tell you something? There's nothing of more value than the life of Jesus, the Son of the Most High God. And He gave His life the highest price possible to redeem you and me. Right, Cheryl? Woo! Woo! You know what that says? I'm of extreme value. God placed a pretty high price. And the devil's been trying to buy you back with lies ever since. He'll promise you the moon and the stars and everything that goes along with it, but it's all smoke and mirrors. It's all smoke and mirrors. Don't buy into it. The only thing that, that has ever done anything for you is the shed blood of Jesus. Forgiveness begins when we see the destructiveness of sin and the futility of life without God. We have to admit that we cannot save ourselves and that our only hope is in the mercy of Almighty God. See, when we request forgiveness, we've got to recognize that we don't deserve it and we cannot demand it. I do not deserve what God has done in my life. I don't deserve to be in this pulpit. I don't even deserve to be in this church. But you know what? God made a way. God looked down through the corridors of time and, and, and saw this crazy guy and said, I want that one. Amen? Our appeal must be for God's love and for His mercy, not His justice. If we got His justice, we would be in a world of hurt. So although we can't demand forgiveness, we can be confident that we have received it because God's gracious, God is loving, and He wants to restore us to Himself just as He wanted to restore Israel. Look at it. Go back and... If you don't read the Old Testament, man, you, gotta, you need to. There's some... Great, great stories in there. You can see the long suffering of God with the children. Them guys were messing up every time they turned around. Listen, I'm going to send you into the promised land. Okay, I've got a, I've got a land for it. It's the promise, the promised land. That kind of lends to it's going to be yours. It's a promise. All you got to do is go in there and possess the land. Well, wait a minute. Hold everything. We better go in there and see if we can possess the land before we go in there. That is not what he said. So they go in, they, they see the land, they recognize it is truly a land flowing with milk and honey, but hey! Did I say milk and honeys? <laughs> milk and honey. <laughs> Period. <laughs> well, I tell you, this tongue of mine will get me in trouble. So they send these guys in there, and only two of them come back with a, with a good report. Because you know what they saw in there? Giants. 
they made a declaration that you and I have made about our own lives over and over. We are but grasshoppers in their sight. Who told them that? Remember what God said, Rich? You can take the land. Good, just go in there. All the rest of them died wandering for the next 40 years in the wilderness, except Joshua and Caleb. They came back with a good report. The fruit of our lips reveals, or refers rather, to a real heartfelt love and a confession of faith. The sacrifice of praise today would include thinking or thanking rather Christ for his sacrifice on the cross and telling others about it. Are you telling others about it? Apparently somebody's saying something because this place is growing. And I'm grateful for it. Our lips should confess God's name in praise. Yet in your typical day, how many times do you hear God's name used profanely? I can tell you on the radio we hear it pretty regularly. We hear it pretty regular. I mean, it, it, it just flows. I'll tell you what, I'll just confess that before, before I got saved, it, it, it flowed well in CB vernacular. It just, it just worked into conversations. Listen, it's, it, we're called not to do that. We're not to use God's name in vain, not to use it with profanity. Christians should tilt the frequency toward praise. How many times in our, in our own town today is God addressed obliquely or casually or politically? Again, as Christians, we should tilt the number towards personally. He's my personal Savior. He personally redeemed me. He personally is preparing a place for me in heaven. Personally. Praise God early in the day before the rush. And then again in the hurried middle. And then at the end of the, as business winds down, praise God. Praise Him as the first fruits of all of your spoken words. In, in, as an offering that says, God loves me and I love God. That's why we need to start our day with praise. Why we need to start our day with prayer. Give God something to, to set your mood. You, do you do daily devotionals? Have you not? Have you missed a day? How's your day? Re, 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 how's your day in regards to the days you do and the days you don't? If you're paying attention, you'll see that there's lack on those days. The sacrifice that's referred to in chapter 13 and verse 15 focuses on believers' praise to God, and just as praise to God flows from the sacri Jesus sacrifice for us so should our works of love. So we know then that loving service cannot save anybody from their sin. You can't work your way into heaven. It's, the, it's a gift. It's a free gift. So, rather, your loving service is an overflow of the love of God in your heart after another sacrifice refers to uh, or please, that pleases God is service to one another. When's the last time you did something for somebody just to do something for them? As an act of love. I don't want anything for this. I just want you to know I love you. I value you. And because of that, I want to do something for you. Amen? Acts of kindness and sharing our resources are particularly pleasing to God, even when it goes unnoticed. Can I just tell you, it doesn't go unnoticed. Folk might not know what's going on, but God does. God does. Doing good to others improves a believer's ability to respond quickly and effectively. Another side of doing good is a willingness to share, especially with those in need. It strikes a blow at the self-centeredness of our times. It's all about me. We see it everywhere. It's all about me. By sharing with others, we get by with less for ourselves so that others have their basic needs met. That's a principle that's long gone. 
that we're called to as children of God to share with one another. That's why he said to bring the tithe into the storehouse so that there would be meat in mine house. Why? So that the church bank account can be full? No, so needs can get met. Amen? Somebody offered me a, 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 an, an offering this morning for our building fund. And I said, is it designated building fund? They said, yes, it is. I said, good. It will, you put it in the offering yourself, and it will go to the building fund. Why? Because I'm a stickler for dedicated money. If you put something in the offering that says it's going to kids' church, it's going to go to kids' church. I remember as a youth pastor in Coos Bay, we did a, a 4th of July fireworks tent. And in, in the Assemblies of God, they had what they called Faith Prom or uh, Speed the Light. Speed the Light was the youth group's uh, extension or uh, whatever of, of mission, uh, meeting missions needs. And so we, we were a little bitty church, and, and uh, so I. I, I at our convention, we pledged $1,200 to, to speed the light, which for us was, I thought, pretty big. So we did this tent and sold fireworks, and we, we made like $6,000 free and clear off this tent. And we're like, holy cow, there's some missionaries going to be happy about this. And they in the assemblies, they have regional and sectional um, banners for this contest for speed the light whatever youth group gives the most well our little church had never ever in in coos bay had never won that banner and when i found out how much money we had and i was at convention we're listening to all these others brought this money and i was like holy man we we're taking home a banner and put it up in the wall it's gonna be awesome our kids were fired up they'd work like dogs all summer long Stacking rocks, doing all kinds of stuff. And when they called our name, they were excited. And they said, South Coast Christian Center, donation of $1,200. And I was like, somebody got something wrong. Because I knew what was there. And when I went and investigated, I found out, nope, you only give $1,200. And so when I went and found out from the church level where it went they said well we, all we felt like we needed to do was meet your obligation which was the twelve hundred dollars i said that's missionary money that's for overseas missions that's missionary money you don't want to mess with missionary money god's heart is for missions and they paved the parking lot with I made up my mind right then. Any money that anybody gives, if it is designated money, it's going to that account and it is hands off. Amen. Amen. We paved the parking lot, which we're going to. It's going to be because there's been money designated to pave the parking lot. Here's a clue. If it don't come in, you're walking in gravel. <laughs> Because I'm not taking money out of the missions account to pay for a, pay, a parking lot. I don't know if you can tell this or not, but that's still a sore spot with me. It, it is. Because I don't know how you can take missionary money and pay a parking lot. Anyway, I'm done with that for now listen believers experience fellowship with other believers when they make their resources available to those who need or are in need we need to being rich in good works may not necessarily benefit our financial statement but in the long run it will be far more valuable asset in god's eyes taking care of each other's emotional financial and physical needs are sacrifices that are very pleasing to god god doesn't overlook that stuff philippians 4 18 paul goes on to say this he refers to the financial gifts that have been brought to him by epaphroditus 
as an as acceptable sacrifice that pleases God. He said, indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphrodites the, the things that you sent me, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Gift, giving of gifts involves a strange kind of reciprocity. In giving, we create bonds of fellowship that return a strong benefit to us. Can I just tell you, in giving to God's work, it's like we generate value in heaven. It's not that we're that we're got some heavenly bank account. It, some churches have exploited this point to, to where giving is pictured almost as a down payment on some piece of heavenly real estate. And that's messed up. This kind of system, the gift becomes no gift at all. Paul didn't want giving to be tainted with self-interest that the giver had personal benefit as a primary goal. In fact, the Bible says don't let the left hand know what the right hand's doing. Sometimes I put offerings in the offering and I don't even put it in an envelope. Which I've, in the early days of our marriage, I got in trouble for that. My wife's a bookkeeper, man. I mean, she's a bookkeeper. She wants to know where it's all at. And I said to her, nobody needs to know but God. And he already knows. And he'll take care of the rest of it. And she understands that. True giving diminishes the lure and the power of money in our lives. Think about the story again back in the Old Testament when the prophet comes to town, when the man of God comes to town. And here's this little widow woman. And what's she doing? She's out gathering some sticks. And the man of God says, hey, what are you doing? Oh, she says, I'm gathering these sticks and I'm going to go in and I'm going to bake a cake. I've got a little tiny bit of flour, got a little bit tiny bit of oil, and I'm going to bake a cake. My son and I are going to eat it and then die. Stop for a minute. Think about what I just said. They're going to eat a cake and then die. They're already in bad shape. And the man of God comes to town, sees what's going on. What does that guy have the audacity to say? He says, well, let me tell you something. Do this. Bake me a cake first. And then you and your son, you bake another one for them, for him and you. She doesn't even question him. She just does it. And her vat never ran dry her flour barrel was never empty why because she saw the value in giving to the lord is that crazy that's crazy we'd be like no i don't think so pal go go to mcdonald's get you a happy meal there ain't nothing happy around here we're gonna bake a cake eat it and die that's desperation but this, the, the idea of giving diminishes the... You cannot outgive God. I don't know if you know that or not. You cannot outgive God. I've tried it. You can't outgive Him. His shovel's bigger than your shovel. We need not clutch at wealth, but rightly share it with people we love and strangers that we are coming to love. Regular giving tells God that He is first and that nothing we possess is more important than Him. Let me, let me close with this. And I'm really going to close. Can I tell you that God wants nothing more from you than your heart. Because if you can give God your heart, lock, stock, and barrel, everything else will fall. Everything else will fall. Nothing 
is more important to God than the condition of your heart. This morning, he's looking for, for hearts that are undone. This morning, he's looking for hearts that are maybe hard. The Bible talks about stony hearts. That God said in his word that he would take out the stony heart and put a heart of flesh in its place. Today, with heads bowed, eyes closed, people praying, God wants to change your heart today. God wants to begin to do some things in your life today that maybe you could never even imagine. Maybe you've never, maybe you've never given an, an offering before, and that's fine. But today you say, God, I want to give you my heart. I want to give you my heart. You can't give him a better offering than your heart. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. So this morning, if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus, remember we're talking about words of truth. Words of truth. If you refuse Jesus, that means you accept the devil in hell. Well, no, I'm not saying that, preacher. Yes, you are. Well, how can you say that? Because there's only two choices. And if you don't on purpose choose Jesus Christ, by default, you choose the enemy. Remember the, the, the roads in the Bible that, that, that Jesus talks about. The road to heaven is narrow and few there are that find it. But the road to hell and destruction is wide and there's many on that road. Can I just tell you this morning that the road to heaven might be narrow but it's big enough for everybody that will call on the name of Jesus. You're here today. He's tugging on your heart. He's saying, I'm the way and the truth and the life. And nobody's going to make heaven without Him. If you're here today and you say, Preacher, I've never accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, but today I, I want to. I want to know that the truth of God's word resides in my heart that forgiveness is mine that I can be redeemed that the that the price that pastor talked about being the highest price am I worthy am I of enough value that Christ would die for me I'm telling you if you'll slip your hand up today he'll show you that you are that valuable he's asking you today if that's you if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord, if you'll slip your hand up today, He will redeem you right in this place. He'll redeem you today. Anybody at all say, Preacher, that's me. I need Jesus. Would you pray for me? Takes a slipped up hand just to raise a hand say, Yep, that's me. Maybe, maybe church, maybe you surrendered to the Lord a long time ago and life happened, stuff happened, and you found yourself today a long ways down the road, just a kind of like a ship, a drift at sea. You're outside the safety of the harbor, and you're just bouncing along. You got no engine, you got no sails, and you got no rows, oars to row the boat, and you're just drifting. You're crying out some way to get back into the, into the safety of the harbor. At one time you were saved. Today, we're being honest, you'd 
maybe you'd have to say, you know, God's in the same place, but I've drifted far away. And today, I want to get back to God. You might have taken many, many, many steps away from Him, but the very word repent literally means to turn around 180 degrees. One step and you're back in the presence of God. Today, if that's you and you're, you're here today and you say, Preacher, I, I was once saved, but now I believe I'm lost and I'm away from God, but I want to be redeemed. I want to be, I want to be back in good graces. I want, to, I want to make God the Lord of my life again. I want to walk afresh and new. I want to be able to say like, like David of old, the psalmist David that says, Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from thy presence and restore the joy of my salvation. That's you today. If you'll slip your hand up, I'll, I want to pray with you. Anybody today, preacher? That's me. That's me, preacher. Hallelujah. Well, Father God, I've said what you've asked me to say, and I've done what you've asked me to do. And Lord, I pray that even if someone is watching by way of the internet today, that if they would simply say, God, forgive me, restore me, create in me a new heart, a clean spirit, that Lord, that you'll touch them, you'll reach out to them, you'll do exactly that. Lord, I pray for each one in this place today. I pray, God, that they sense something of your Spirit in this place. God, that you would bring healing. Lord, we lift Ron to you today in the hospital. Suffered a heart attack just a day or so ago. Would you heal him, Lord? Heal him. We just celebrated with through the bread that the, 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 the healing that you bore the wounds for our healing, Lord. I pray for my niece who's just had triplets very prematurely. Lord, they need you t- your touch. They need you to intervene in those little babies' lives. God, touch them. Touch them, Lord. Father, we love you. We give you all the glory. And all the honor and the praise for all that's done in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Hey, God bless you. God go with you. Have a great rest of your day. See you at Tom and Susan's at 4 o'clock. Everybody's invited. Amen? God bless you. God go with you.